NTD News. I'm Jasmina Davis. Here are today's top stories. Aggressive action against TikTok and WeChat, two social media apps with parent companies based in China. President Trump issues executive orders against them. Little progress is made in virus relief talks. Yet White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows says the good news is President Trump said to stay engaged in negotiations. The New York Times cuts its relationship with Chinese state media, China Daily. It's been running its paid propaganda supplements for almost half a century. U.S. Customs and Border Protection staff face exposure to the virus. A law was brought in during the pandemic to give them added protection. Just in, the United States imposed sanctions on Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam, the territory's current and former police chiefs, and eight other officials for their role in curtailing political freedoms in the territory. The sanctions were imposed under an executive order President Trump signed last month to punish China for its moves against dissents in Hong Kong. They are the latest action by his administration against the Chinese Communist Party. The sanctions also target Hong Kong Police Commissioner Chris Tang and his predecessor. Secretary of the Treasury Steven Mnuchin said in a statement, The United States stands with the people of Hong Kong and we will use our tools and authorities to target those undermining their autonomy. President Trump taking another step to protect the security of U.S. citizens. Social media apps TikTok and WeChat have well-known ties to the Chinese regime. The president is banning transactions with both apps from September 20th. President Trump issued executive orders to ban transactions with video sharing app TikTok and social media app WeChat. The executive order calls it aggressive action to protect U.S. national security. The ban will come into effect in 45 days after the order and will include both parent companies, Chinese-owned ByteDance and Tencent Holdings. President Trump issued the orders under the International Emergency Economic Powers Act and the National Emergencies Act. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross will define the transactions covered by the prohibition. Both orders noted that the apps automatically capture vast swaths of information from its users. This potentially allows, quote, the Chinese Communist Party access to Americans' personal and proprietary information, unquote. Under a Chinese law introduced in 2017, Chinese companies have an obligation to support and cooperate with the party's national intelligence work. This means sharing information with the regime. Such information captured from users include internet and other network activity information, such as location data and browsing and search histories. According to the order for TikTok, the holders of this information would be able to track the locations of federal employees and contractors, as well as use personal information for blackmail and conduct corporate espionage. A researcher in March last year found a huge Chinese database that contained billions of WeChat messages sent from users in the United States and other countries. Also on Thursday, the U.S. Senate voted to approve a bill banning federal employees from using TikTok on government-issued devices. It received unanimous support. A combined House and Senate version of the bill will go to the president to be signed into law. The latest data shows the U.S. economy added 1.8 million jobs in July, less than the record rise in June, but higher than economists expected. The unemployment rate fell to 10.2 percent. And we are seeing early signs of recovery. We track job demand daily, and employers are increasing their demand for new jobs in our country. So we're, we're on the right path, and I think the, the report shows that. The Labor Department says there were job gains in hospitality, government, retail, business services, and health care. So far, the U.S. economy has recovered about 40 percent of jobs lost due to the pandemic. And President Trump signed an executive order meant to free the U.S. from dependence on China for medical supplies. The legislation will make sure that medicines, medical supplies, and equipment are made in the United States. President Donald Trump signed an executive order in Ohio to ensure that medical supplies and equipment will be made in the United States and not in foreign countries. The executive order won't just cover medicines, but also...
medical supplies such as masks, gloves, goggles, and medical equipment like ventilators. Trump said that the CCP virus pandemic has brought awareness to the danger of China and other countries denying the U.S. essential products when it needs them most. He says the executive order will reduce the U.S.'s dependence on other countries for manufacturing. We're going to bring them home where they belong and we'll end reliance on China just like we did with the washers and dryers, just like we did with many other things. We'll be making our product here safely, beautifully, and inexpensively. According to a White House advisor, the executive order has three components, which include the Buy American order to ensure that government agencies buy American products. Another component is easing rules for the development of advanced manufacturing facilities in the United States. Putting the order into effect also intends to increase government demand for U.S.-made products. This will help create a market for manufacturers to invest and to produce in the United States. Still, no deal on relief talks, but White House negotiator Mark Meadows says he will stay engaged in talks. And Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin says the president is willing to give aid to states, but only if it's related to the virus. Negotiators failed to make much progress Thursday on a new virus aid bill. American people is White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows said the president engaged, told them to continue to stay engaged in negotiations. If that does not work, the president uh, has instructed Secretary Mnuchin and myself to be willing to enter into a, a, a narrower deal that, uh, that addresses some of the most pressing needs uh, that are before us as, as a nation. He said if those two things don't work, then the president is prepared to take executive action on his own. In a tweet Thursday, Trump says his staff is working on such a package. He says it includes a payroll tax cut, eviction protections, unemployment assistance, and student loan help. Still urge them. To Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer said an executive order would leave millions of people out. It will be litigated, it won't be effective, and things will get worse. So we urge them to rethink their position. Their position is sort of their way or the highway. And their education. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said the Republican proposal wasn't just skinny, it was anorexic. It's so clear uh, that, this, that we should do something, and we should do something big, and we should do it in a way that is bipartisan as we have done every other bill. One of the biggest sticking points is financial help for states. In a shift, the Treasury Secretary said, although the president won't do a massive deal to bail out states, he is willing to offer targeted aid. The president is prepared to do something for state and locals that deals with the issue of additional coronavirus expenses, deals with making sure that the first responders, the hospitals, the police, the firemen all have proper funding and the school teachers. Another sticking point is keeping unemployment enhancement at $600 per week. Meadows said they offered to extend it, but Democrats refused it twice. Talks are set to continue. In new efforts to further transparency among U.S. media, Twitter is adding labels to state-affiliated organizations. That's as the New York Times says it's calling the paid Chinese prop state propaganda. It's featured in its newspaper since 1975. The New York Times has reportedly deleted hundreds of advertorials by a Chinese propaganda outlet. The American newspaper ending its decades-long relationship with the state media, China Daily. According to the Washington Free Beacon, NYT made the decision at the beginning of this year to stop accepting branded content ads from state-run media. The English-language newspaper, China Daily, has over the years paid millions of dollars to major American outlets. These include the Washington Post and Wall Street Journal. They ran Chinese propaganda supplements called China Watch, disguised as news. The Washington Post told the Epoch Times in June that it no longer includes the advertorials that it ran for more than 30 years. The Wall Street Journal still features the paid propaganda. China Daily's recent financial filings with the Justice Department show that it paid nearly $6 million to the Wall Street Journal since November 2016. Twitter already banned state-backed media from advertising in 2019, and now it's going a step further. State-affiliated media outlets and their senior staff will be labeled as such on Twitter. A Twitter spokesman listed Russia's Sputnik, RT, and China's Xinhua News as some of the organizations indicated. He said no U.S. media outlets were on the list. Twitter said state finance media outlets with editorial independence would not be labeled. The United States is offering a reward of up to $10 million to prevent the presidential election from being hacked. 
The State Department is putting up the reward as part of its Reward for Justice program. It will give the money to people who disclose information on foreign hackers interfering with the coming election. A Senate Intelligence Committee report in April found that Russia engaged in efforts to influence the outcome of the 2016 election. And with the next presidential election only months away, it wants to prevent similar efforts this year. Information on the program can be found on the State Department's website. U.S. Customs and Border staff are at risk of infection. A number already lost their lives to the virus. The acting commissioner says the law, Title 42, is helping reduce exposure. Acting Commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection Mark Morgan said that people entering the country illegally present serious risk to personnel. He said those entering show complete disregard of even the most basic application of health and safety precautions. A number of CBP personnel already paid with their lives following exposure to the virus at work. CBP has already lost 10 personnel in the line of duty because of COVID. 10 already. Morgan said a new law implemented by the Trump administration is a great help to remove illegal entrants as quickly as possible. The law called Title 42 allows CBP to expel certain border crossers without having to transport them to CBP facilities, thus reducing possible exposures to the virus. We're trying to remove them as fast as we can to not put them in our Congress settings, to not put them into our system, to not have them remain in the United States for a long period of time. Meanwhile, under the U.S. border, Homeland Security found a new smuggling tunnel. The incomplete tunnel ran from San Luis, Arizona, to a Mexican neighborhood. It had a ventilation system, water lines, electrical wiring, a rail system, and extensive reinforcement. It measured at about three feet wide and four feet high. Homeland Security investigations found the tunnel in late July. According to Border Patrol personnel, this may be the most sophisticated smuggling tunnel in U.S. history. And up next, New York's Attorney General filed a lawsuit against the National Rifle Association. She claims the group is illegally handling funds, but the NRA says it's a political attack against them ahead of the 2020 election. And coming up next, people entering New York City by train from out of state are now being screened. It's another way the city is enforcing the governor's executive order to quarantine. Con Edison says power is restored to parts of Manhattan. An early morning outage left hundreds of thousands without electricity. The outage affected lights, cell phone service, and the subway system. The social media video shows residents re reacting to the blackout. It affected several areas of Manhattan, including Harlem, the Upper West Side, and the Upper East Side. Con Edison said it began just after 5 a.m. The company acknowledged the power outage in a tweet, and reports say the outage affected more than 187,000 customers. Con Edison is investigating a problem in their transmission system. The power loss disrupted the signal system and station lighting on some subway lines. Disruptions continued to impact some locations even after power was restored. And New York Governor Andrew Cuomo mandated that everyone who wants to can vote with an absentee ballot in the state's primaries. Many people took him up on the offer, but now it's revealed that one in five ballots weren't counted. According to new certified election results, around 20 percent of mail-in ballots sent in by New York City voters were not counted. More than 400,000 voted by absentee ballot in the state's primary. But the City Board of Elections says less than 320,000 mail-in ballots were counted. That means more than one in five ballots, over 80,000 in total, were rejected. One reason is that more than 10 times the number of absentee ballots were used than in a normal year. Governor Andrew Cuomo mandated that any voter who wanted to could vote by mail. U.S. Postal Service workers reportedly struggled to handle the volume and failed to properly process some ballots. Others were rejected because they were incomplete or lacked a valid postmark or signature. In one district in Brooklyn, one in eight ballots lacked a postmark and were ruled invalid by election officials. 
State Commissioner Douglas Kellner, said the local boards of elections are preparing for the November general election and are thus highly unlikely to change the results. The board declared Representative Carolyn Maloney as the winner over Patel, who challenged her in the Democratic primary. New York's Attorney General filed a lawsuit today against the National Rifle Association with the goal to dissolve it. The AG says NRA executives grossly mishandled funds, but the NRA says the lawsuit is a transparent attempt to score political points and a premeditated move. NTD's Melina Weiskup has the details. The National Rifle Association, or NRA, fights to defend Second Amendment rights and is the largest and most influential pro-gun organization in the nation. Attorney General Letitia James filed a lawsuit to dissolve the organization on the basis that it diverts millions of dollars away from the organization's charitable cause and is funneling them towards personal use. The NRA's board's uh, audit committee was negligent in its duty to ensure appropriate, competent, and judicious stewardship of assets by NRA leadership. The lawsuit charges the whole organization and four executive members with failing to follow local and state laws, which the attorney general claims resulted in a $64 million loss for the NRA. We reached out to the NRA for our response, who told us they've gotten more than 1,000 media inquiries since the lawsuit was filed. The NRA CEO told us in a written statement that, quote, the NY Attorney General's actions are an affront to democracy and freedom. And on Twitter, the president called the move a political attack coming just in time for the 2020 election. The NRA has in turn filed a lawsuit against the Attorney General on the basis that she used the political prosecution of the NRA as a central campaign theme when she ran in 2018. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. In a statement, the NRA told us that they are ready to fight the case because they are well-governed, financially solvent, and committed to good governance. And New York City is now intercepting travelers coming in by train from out of state. City employees are at Penn Station are handing out flyers, taking down information, and telling them to quarantine. They must stay at home or in a hotel for two weeks. And if they don't comply, they'll they could face a $10,000 fine. Our reporter Kevin Hogan brings us more about travelers' reactions to being screened. We're here in Penn Station, New York, where Amtrak travelers coming from out of state are being told to quarantine for 14 days. Employees from the Public Engagement Unit are educating people on the rule, and they say they're here to help. The city will provide taxis, hotels, food, medicine, and even legal support for people quarantining. The city will also provide eviction prevention and help negotiating with employers if they have a problem with people working from home. The COO of New York City's Health and Hospitals, Chris Keeley, says the city will also help them get tested. And if they need resources like getting a COVID test, we'll get them connected with a COVID test. If they test positive, then we would absolutely do contact tracing on them, just as we do for anyone in New York City that tests positive for COVID. Keeley says he's having great conversations with people coming in and that passengers have been positive and responsive. You guys were fabulous. I mean, the website was great. It was really informative. I wish every state was doing this. After people give their information by filling out the form, the city may contact them by phone, text, or even knocking on their door to say hello. Tim and Donna are coming from South Carolina, and they don't see the screening as an inconvenience and plan to go through with the quarantine while they visit their family for a few weeks. They weren't forcing you to stop. Some people walk by, some people, you know, just use your, use your head, it's common sense, and it's not that offensive. Other travelers aren't as concerned about quarantining. Do you plan to quarantine? No, I'm good. Do you plan to do the quarantine that they're recommending? Everything is good. I was just getting from Savannah. Everything is fine. Passengers on trains coming from D.C., Boston, Rhode Island, and Maryland are being screened. But the city has put a focus on trains coming from areas where community spread is high, such as Miami. Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York. Protesters in New York City are challenging the NBA to show support for Hong Kongers and the persecuted Uyghurs in Xinjiang. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more from the NBA headquarters. Outside of the NBA's headquarters, Reverend Patrick Mahoney says no one in the NBA has condemned the human rights violations in China. Not one team owner, not one general manager, not Commissioner Silver, no one has spoken out in a league which prides itself on being committed to social justice has spoken out against these atrocities 
by the Chinese Communist Party against their own people. So Mahoney challenged the NBA during the live stream protest to stand with pro-democracy Hong Kongers and the persecuted Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Last year, the NBA got itself into hot water after apologizing to China over a tweet by the Houston Rockets general manager, Daryl Morey. That tweet said, stand with Hong Kong, so the NBA's apology didn't sit well with some of their fans. Chris Slattery, a New Yorker and Knicks fan, says it's time for a boycott until the NBA makes some changes and shows it's concerned with China's human rights abuses. I want to see knees. I want to see uh, demonstrations. I want to see... Uh, threats to cut back uh, all their entertainment to the Chinese people. I want to see some substantive changes from the NBA. One thing Reverend Mahoney said he wants to see is the NBA to stop doing business with communist China. But two people told us they think it's all about money. So do you think the NBA should have business with China? Of course. It's all about this right here. It's all about money. Man. It's all about this. If it ain't about the money. Another man told us that the NBA should stand with Hong Kong, but said it's not only about the sports league. Well, I don't think it's just the NBA. I think it's anyone. It's the, it's baseball, it's soccer, it's the UN. Like, why isn't the UN putting more pressure on China about what's going on in Hong Kong? Mahoney wants to see the NBA release a statement that it stands with Hong Kong. He said he's also going to make a video for LeBron James with short stories from people suffering from human rights abuses in Hong Kong and Xinjiang. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Still to come, two document shredding trucks were seen parked in front of the Chinese consulate in New York. That's after the Chinese consulate in Houston was closed and documents were burned. And a different type of plague from Wuhan is wrecking havoc in the U.S., but this time it's a drug and not a virus. Find out more about its dangers when we return. Chinese consulates in the U.S. seem to be on thin ice after one in Houston was ordered to close. Mobile paper shredding trucks spotted outside the Chinese consulate in New York are now raising questions. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more. The Chinese consulate in Houston was recently ordered to close. That's after the Trump administration accused it of being a hub for espionage activity by the Chinese Communist Party. So what about the other Chinese embassies or consulates across the U.S.? On Thursday, we saw two trucks from a document destruction company in front of the Chinese consulate in New York. Over 10 trash containers filled with shredded paper were loaded onto the trucks. Around noon, one truck came. It's from USA Shred, a company that professionally shreds papers and documents. Workers were seen dragging trash containers to the truck. When our photographer managed to take a closer look, he found paper inside the containers. Workers continued dragging more and more containers to the truck. Later, a second truck came. The process lasted for at least two hours until our photographer left around 2.30 p.m. During the operation, a Chinese man was seen on the site who appeared to be an embassy member. He spoke with the workers from the shredding company. But when he noticed our photographer, he called a guard. After talking to the man, the guard approached our photographer and tried to get him to leave. Bystanders who were protesting there against China's human rights violations told us that yesterday they saw vehicles from the shredding company parked in front of the consulate. Fentanyl, a synthetic opioid, once killed more than 30,000 people in a single year in the U.S., and the crisis is still going on. Most of the fentanyl in the U.S. street markets originate in Wuhan, China. Most of the fentanyl on U.S. street markets originates from China. The regulatory system doesn't effectively police a country's pharmaceutical and chemical industries. That's according to a recent RAND analysis. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid and has quickly become America's most dangerous drug. According to the CDC's 2018 data, more than 30,000 people in the U.S. died after taking fentanyl or one of its close chemical relatives. No other drug in modern history has killed more people in a year. Just two milligrams, enough to cover Lincoln's beard on a penny, can prove fatal. 
Over the past decade, Wuhan has emerged as the global headquarters for fentanyl production. The city's chemical and pharmaceutical manufacturers hide their drug production within their larger legal manufacturing operations. According to a recent ABC News report, huge amounts of these mail-order fentanyl components can be traced to a single state-subsidized company in Wuhan. Chinese manufacturers export the drug in two ways. Either they send shipments directly to the U.S. via American Postal Service, UPS and FedEx using the dark web to process orders, or they ship fentanyl and precursor chemicals to drug cartels in Mexico. The final product is then smuggled into America. Ben Westhoff is the author of Fentanyl Incorporated. When he started his research on fentanyl precursors NPP and 4-ANPP, he found these chemicals were all over the internet. And he discovered most of the companies selling fentanyl precursors are under the Wuhan Yuanchen Group umbrella. Westhoff believes that Wuhan Yuanchen sells more illicit fentanyl precursors than any other company. He then spent a year disguised as a potential customer and kept contact with 17 of Yuanchen's salespeople. He even paid its Wuhan headquarters an in-person visit in January 2018. When Westhoff inquired about their products, a Yuanchen saleswoman named Alyssa told him the company provides food additives officially, steroids and 4-ANPP NPP underground. Another salesperson, Chen Li, said our products are sold to the United States less often, adding that more is sold to Mexico. Westhoff met Ye Chunfa, the chief of the company, at the Wuhan headquarters. Ye told him that the company has 30 branch companies in China. In February 2019, Westhoff called Ye and revealed his identity as a journalist. Ye did not deny selling fentanyl precursors, but said through an interpreter, anything that the country schedules, we don't sell. As long as it's scheduled, we won't sell it. If it's not scheduled, we can sell it. Ye feigned ignorance about selling unscheduled fentanyl precursor chemicals. Westhoff then asked him why Yuan Chen mailed some of its chemicals in disguised packaging, an effort to evade customs. He then went silent. Westhoff concludes the only reason the company buys the ingredients from China is because it's easy and cheap. But the results have been tragic. A chart from USA Facts shows that eight times more overdose deaths were attributed to fentanyl between 2013 and 2017. The Trump administration has urged Beijing to police fentanyl. Despite Chinese leader Xi promising that the illicit exports would stop, they didn't. The regime's negligence, if not intentional malice, remain contributing factors to the drug's harm. Chinese netizens are laughing at a poster designed for the People's Liberation Army Day celebration. The holiday aims to show gratitude to China's military for safeguarding the country. But the poster has sparked humor because none of the aircraft carriers or warships pictured actually belong to China. A Chinese real estate corporation designed a poster in celebration of PLA Day, which falls on August 1st. Directed towards the Chinese army, the poster reads, Thank you for your protection. We have a home and a world. Yet the aircraft carriers and warships that appear in the poster don't belong to China. Instead, they're from the U.S., France, Britain, the Netherlands, and Italy. A netizen posted the image on Weibo with a comment asking sarcastically, Doesn't the U.S. aircraft carrier fleet look near and dear? American Chinese media outlet The New Heights conducted an online poll earlier this week on Twitter among only Chinese users. It asked, if the U.S. is determined to overthrow the Chinese communist regime, do you plan to side with the U.S. military or the CCP's army if war breaks out? Results show that more than 80 percent of voters chose to stand with the U.S., while only 8 percent said they'd help the CCP. 10 percent remained neutral. A 2018 survey from Chinese web portal NetEase posed a similar question to people in China. The survey asked, how much will you donate to your country in the case of a war? And the pinned reply says, I will donate 1000 to the U.S. Someone else also replied to the comment, writing, I agree with you, and I'll send information to the U.S. Army. Up next, the chief investment officer at the largest U.S. pension fund resigns. He's been accused of falsifying documents and having ties to the Chinese Communist Party. Uber 
Uber's delivery service is now the company's biggest source of revenue. Second quarter revenue from Uber Eats was $1.2 billion, double what it was a year ago. And at the same time, Uber's ride-sharing service plummeted 67%. Over that same time period, gross bookings for rides declined 73%, while Uber Eats bookings grew 113%. Even with the jump from Uber Eats, the company lost $1.8 billion during the second quarter. It comes at a time when Uber is restructuring because of the pandemic. The company has cut about 6,700 jobs. And the investment chief at the largest U.S. pension fund, CalPERS, is resigning. CalPERS didn't give a reason for his resignation. He's only been there for 18 months, but just a few days ago, he was accused of falsifying documents. NTD's Phil Zhou is following it. Ben Meng, chief investment officer of the largest U.S. pension fund, the California Public Employees Retirement System, or CalPERS, has resigned. CalPERS manages around $400 billion in pension and health benefits for millions of California public employees and their families. The sudden departure comes days after the Naked Capitalism blog accused Meng of falsifying financial documents, and it pointed out CalPERS failure to reveal the documents or make Meng correct them. We spoke to compliance expert Tom Fox, who says both parties are at fault in this. Uh, it's, it's his fault for having the conflict of interest, number one. Number two, CalPERS' fault for not reviewing the forms and making a determination that he's inappropriate because of this potential conflict of interest. Uh, by owning or having an interest in any of the private equity firms where Alpers might be uh, investing funds, that's a clear conflict of interest. In a previous interview, hedge fund manager Kyle Bass said Meng is actually a member of the Chinese Communist Party. Ben Meng, the CIO of Calpers, uh, is part of the Thousand Talents program and a member of the Chinese Communist Party. Bass says he's not sure where Meng's loyalties lie and that things need to change. He was the deputy director of China's currency administrator. You don't get a top five job in China unless you are part of the party elite. He somehow, some way, has weaseled his way in to be the CIO of the largest pension fund in the United States, and he is shoveling dollars to China. Earlier this year, Congressman Jim Banks wrote a letter to California's governor. He asked for an investigation to Meng's misappropriation of pension funds into Chinese companies and his relationship to the Chinese Communist Party. Banks tweeted, Now would be a good time for CalPERS to drop their investment in the PLA and CCP. Americans shouldn't be investing in our biggest adversary's military. In a release statement, CalPERS didn't say the reason for the chief's departure and that it will immediately search for a permanent successor. Average rates on long-term mortgages fell again this week. It's the eighth time this year rates on the 30-year loan hit a record low. Freddie Mac says they dropped to 2.88%. That's down from 2.99% last week. And it's the lowest level since Freddie started tracking them in 1971. The rate averaged 3.6% just a few years ago. The average rate on the 15 fixed-year rate mortgage also fell. The dropped to 2.44 percent. That's down from 2.51 percent last week. With mortgage rates hitting another record low, many home owners are asking, is now a good time to refinance? NTD's Catherine Wen talked to an expert to find out what you should consider when refinancing. For the first time in half a century, the mortgage rate for an average 30-year fixed loan has fallen below 3 percent. It's led to a spike in refinancing. So is it right for you? We spoke with senior financial planner Zev Fried to break it down. The first thing to consider is how much lower your new rate is. It'll help you know if refinancing is worth it. If you're going to get a half a point, which is the 50, and certainly 75, it usually does pay to do it. But it's not just about the rate. You should also consider closing costs. Divide the cost by how much you'll save each month and see how long it'll take you to break even, whether it's just a few years or longer than that. But anything beyond that, you have to say to yourself, well, am I keeping the home? Am I keeping that mortgage for more than, you know, two, four, five, six years? Because often people think they're going to be there for 15, 20 years. But in reality, either they decide to move, life circumstances change, or they need to do something different with their loan. And what about a shorter term? With the rate so low, you may get a 15-year loan and still be able to afford the monthly payment. 
But Freed's advice is, if you have the extra money, put it toward the loan. You don't want to lock yourself into a mortgage with higher monthly payments. So should you wait more in case rates get even lower? It reaches a point where banks will not go lower because they just not, are not going to make enough money. Uh, this, the sense is that it's really not going to go lower than where we are now. He suggests not trying to time the market. He says to grab the opportunity when you can. There's no guarantee the downward trend will continue. Reporting by Catherine Wen, NTD News. In June, the country's authorities said he was under investigation over the multi-billion dollar Wirecard probe. The Philippines was connected to the Wirecard saga when the firm claimed that the missing money had been kept in two of the country's banks, which the banks denied. A former executive of the German payment giant Wirecard has been reported dead in the Philippines. The Financial Times said Christopher Bauer's death was reported to a civil registry in Manila last week. And up next, classical music by Candlelight. A harpist helps her audience savor classical music in a historic building and a new kind of performance that's spreading across the globe. And British government finally allows a group of beavers to live naturally in England. More on these after the break. Have you ever been to a classical music concert illuminated only by candlelight? These performances are growing in popularity in cities across the globe. Our France correspondent, David Vives, met with some of the musicians in Paris. Imagine being surrounded by hundreds of candles, one arm's length from a musician who's playing for you. These are candlelight concerts, performances organized by Spanish startup Fever in major cities across the globe, New York, Rome, Singapore. In Paris, a few steps from the opera, Harpist Alexandra Lucianu rehearses her show. In a few moments, she'll perform in the hall of this hotel, built during Napoleon III's reign. It's the first time she'll perform among candlelight. Fever Up France's manager accompanies her. Our idea is to bring the artist and audience together. We use the standard scenes and stages as little as possible. For this scene design, the artist is in the middle of the hall. Azerwal says candlelight concerts bring the audience to another level in their experience of classical music. In Paris, these concerts feature famed musicians in churches, hotels, and even cathedrals. This candlelight idea is to bring back some feelings you had in church with light and shade or chiaroscuro. It really allows you to merge with the ambience and creates a romantic effect. According to Azerwal, all concerts are played to a full audience. For most, it's their first classical performance. Before each song, Lucianu talks about what to listen for and how to enjoy the music more deeply. She's happy she can help make classical music more available. We're going to discover together with the audience how the harp is full of surprise. Music allows you to feel very different feelings, sometimes linked to a memory of a short moment in your life, and it expresses a variety of emotions. While playing, Luciano suggests that the audience close their eyes to grasp the beauty of the music and its power of relaxation. A moment when time stands still between light and shade, Reporting by David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Over to Europe, French President Emmanuel Macron is the first foreign leader visiting Lebanon's blast site, and he is calling for the former French colony to have political reform. NTD UK's Neil Woodrow will bring us news from Europe. Thanks and welcome to our UK newsroom with UK and European news. French President Emmanuel Macron offered France's support for the Lebanese people while visiting Beirut. Macron is the first foreign leader to visit Lebanon after the massive blast on Tuesday. He met Lebanese President Michel Aoun and Prime Minister Hassan Diab. Before the meeting, he visited the site of the blast and nearby shattered streets while surrounded by crowds of emotional people. We will bring food and material to rebuild homes, but what is also needed here is a profound political change. Crowds shouted, revolution, revolution. 
Even before the pandemic, Lebanon was suffering from a severe economic crisis leading to mass anti-government protests. Macron promised more support from both France and on a European level, and that he would engage in frank dialogue with Lebanon's leaders over reforms. It's a political, moral, economic and financial crisis, the first victim of which is the Lebanese people. It requires reactions extremely quickly. Lebanon was a French colony and France has long sought to support it. France has sent emergency aid since the blast, but is worried about corruption and has pressed for political and economic reforms. The Hong Kong government has denounced a UK parliamentary report that slams the actions of Hong Kong police. The report looked into human rights abuses by Hong Kong police against humanitarian and medical workers from 2019 onwards. They found aid workers were subjected to intimidation, harassments, threats, physical violence and arrests. This meant injured protesters were delayed or stopped completely from receiving treatment. The aid workers were not involved in any hostility, says the report. One recommendation is for the UK to urgently impose Magnitsky-style sanctions on individuals responsible for permitting the excessive police violence. This should include Chief Executive Carrie Lam and the police commissioner. Moving on, the head of the Bank of England says he's not currently considering negative interest rates. Bank Governor Andrew Bailey made the comment in an interview with CNBC. That was right after the bank's Monetary Policy Committee voted unanimously to keep benchmark interest rates at an all-time low of 0.1%. Negative interest rates, first introduced in the 1990s, are used under extraordinary economic circumstances. Bailey says they can be useful to have in the toolbox. It's actually quite, I mean, it's doable and it's been done. I mean, a lot of continental Europe obviously is in that position at the moment, so it's not that it can't be done. Instead of receiving interest on savings, clients are charged interest for keeping their money in the bank. I mean, I think there would, you know, there would be a lot of explaining to do by us, <laughs> um, you know, of what this means, why we're doing it, and what the benefits of it would be. Bailey was asked if he'd consider negative interest rates next year. He said he can't comment about future policy decisions. And the British government has appointed Dame Barbara Woodward as its permanent representative to the United Nations in New York. Woodward is currently the British ambassador to China. She will succeed Karen Pearce, who was assigned as the new British ambassador to the United States. The UK is a founding member of the UN and one of five permanent members of its Security Council. 59-year-old Woodward joined the UK's Foreign Office 26 years ago and has previously worked at the UK Embassy in Moscow. And the London Marathons, rescheduled for October the 4th, is now an elite-only event. The marathon normally attracts around 40,000 runners and raises millions for charity. This year it will be very different. Elite men, women and wheelchair athletes will battle it out on a fan-restricted circuit. The men's race features Eliud Kipchoge and Kenyanisa Bekele. They're the only two to have run the marathon in under two hours, two minutes. Defending champion Kipchoge is seeking a record fifth London title. With Boston, Berlin, New York and Chicago marathons already cancelled, the London race takes on even more importance for the top runners. Charity runners can defer their place to a future London marathon. And 15 families of beavers have been given the right to remain on the River Otter in southern England. They're the first beavers to live naturally in England in over 400 years. The decision was made by the government after a five-year study by the Devon Wildlife Trust into beavers' impact on the local environment. British Environment Minister Rebecca Powell says beavers can benefit farming. If he wants a more diverse habitat to work alongside with our farming and our healthy and sustainable food production, then natural management systems like this that the beavers can provide are one of the answers. The study allowed the master dam makers to thrive. They've built 28 dams. Other creatures such as fish, insects and birds are benefiting from wetland habitats enhanced by the beavers. Their dams even reduced flood risk to some human homes. Beavers were hunted to extinction in England 400 years ago for their meat, water-resistant pelts and a substance they secrete called castorium that's used in food, medicine and perfume. Then in 2013, they were found on the River Otter. Now there are at least 50 adults and kits on the river and they're here to stay. That's all from us for now. Thanks for watching. Back to New York.
Coming up, Discovery Channel Shark Week aims to give viewers a glimpse of these creatures' majesty after the break. The TV executives and filmmakers behind Discovery Channel's Shark Week want to educate and entertain. Shark Week goes for one week each summer on Discovery Channel. This year, the network will air more than 20 hours of TV dedicated to sharks. Just as in previous years, viewer expectations are high. It's, it's one of the things that keeps us up at night every day of just what are we going to do to top last year and what are we going to do to deliver some excitement. So the producers say sharks should be appreciated as majestic animals, critical to our oceans. But often they're seen as monsters. Shark Week was sort of born from, look, these aren't the mindless killing machines that you see portrayed in the movies. These are incredible animals whose importance to the ecosystem is immeasurable. Um, and they're, they're just really interesting, amazing animals. Filmmaker Jeff Kerr has worked on a number of Shark Week shows over the years, but he is best known for the program Air Jaws. Kerr believes the TV event inspires viewers to pursue their passion for sharks and changes the world for the better. I think of all of the marine biologists that I've met over the years, the younger ones who've been inspired by Shark Week to become a marine biologist because they you know, were watching these programs when it first began, uh, the filmmakers, all of the ecotourism around the world that started because of Shark Week. The television event first debuted in 1988. Shark Week runs from August 9th through August 16th. And that's all for now. Catch us again at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Jasmina Davis.